You're listening to the Back Porch Talk Podcast. Danny and Jason had many discussions and debates on the back porch while making pivotal investment moves with assets. That's right, with trading cards. They welcome you to the back porch and right into those discussions about current sports news with a fresh and unique twist. So come on and join us. Welcome to the Back Porch Talk Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jason. I'm your co-host, Danny. And oh boy, fans, we have a packed show for you today. Some new stuff on the horizon in this show. Listen, first we're going to talk about the NBA. Just a little NBA news. Get into a little bit of baseball playoffs. Talk about the NFL, what's happening, especially with the John Gruden news. And then also... Oh, boy, we have some interesting information here about boxing. But first to the NBA and where we actually have Ben Simmons actually returning back to the 76ers. Danny, what in the hell is going on? <laughs> He's starting to lose out money. That's what's going on. <laughs> yeah, the pockets are getting light. There you go. And so Ben Simmons uh, has decided to uh, appear at the arena in Philly and uh, took the COVID test waiting for the results back. Uh, I don't think he can get back uh, with the team officially until Friday once he gets the results and all back. Uh, and then we'll see what happens, how this really all comes together. Whether or not Ben Simmons will be fully integrated with the team. Mm -hmm. uh, is he going to fully practice with the team? Is he going to be, how is he going to be on a court? Did he get a jumper over the summer? Is he going to even take a shot whether it's a 5, 10, 12-foot shot. I mean, is he going to take a shot? Uh, man, there's a whole lot of drama, a whole lot of interesting um, stay tuned type scenarios with Ben Simmons. What say you, Danny? Yeah, Jay, I was as shocked as you were, man, when I saw that he showed up at the arena on Monday night. And I bet you the Sixers were as well because they were expecting him actually later this week mm -hmm. to show up. Um, based on what was reported. So I actually see them because they're asking for a lot for Ben Simmons. And if they could have traded him, I thought I think they would have traded him by now. So I don't see him going anywhere. I don't see them benching him, you know, like they did Andre Drummond last year with uh, mm -hmm. who's at Cleveland. But mm -hmm. they sat him out until they traded him. Mm -hmm. They need Ben Simmons. Or they need somebody for Ben Simmons to make that team a top four team in the Eastern Conference. So unless something develops over the next couple of weeks, mm -hmm. he may be out by the trading deadline or before that. But I don't see how they can not play him unless they have something behind the scenes they're working on that we're not privy to at this time. So I guess we'll see him next week when the season kicks off on uh, – I don't think they play October 19th, but next week. So mm -hmm. welcome back, Ben Simmons. And Kyrie Irving, Danny, has decided, well, let me rephrase that. The Brooklyn Nets has indicated and announced that Kyrie Irving will not be with the team until he's fully vaccinated. Mm -hmm. This thing that's very interesting. I mean, Danny, you and I, we talked offline about about a potential scenario. Obviously, the Brooklyn Nets is one of the uh, teams that are gunning for a championship run here mm -hmm. and a legitimate championship run. And by the state of New York having their particular mandates, and now some other cities are starting to announce their mandates. Let's just say, for instance, that the Brooklyn Nets and the Los Angeles Lakers make it to the finals. And let's just say the Brooklyn Nets has home court advantage in a seven game series. Both of those cities actually have mandates. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, that would not allow Kyrie Irving to participate in an NBA finals. Yep. And so I think that's what the Brooklyn Nets are really looking at. Not only that, but we're talking about the regular season. We're talking about seeding in the Eastern conference which is now a very competitive conference mm -hmm. there's not going to be time for anybody 
of great talent like a Kyrie Irving to really sit down and just not participate. So kudos to the Brooklyn Nets, man. Now, granted, this is a touchy, obviously a touchy topic with regards to everybody has their own thoughts and opinions um, about the uh, vaccine. Um, and, um, and so obviously re religion could play a, a role here and I respect um, the religion, I uh, respect uh, so everybody's right to choose. At the same token, you gotta look at it from a team perspective. And if the team is vaccinated, if the team is really gunning for a championship run, not starting after the all-star break, but they're gunning you for it at the very start. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, who's their first matchup? None other than the defending champions, our Milwaukee Bucks, opening night. And so I think the Brooklyn Nets made a good decision for the Brooklyn Nets. What say you, Danny? I don't think they had really a choice in the matter because basketball team is not that big either. It's not like NFL where it's 53 plus how many people around. NBA team is smaller. and from their perspective too, they have to get some cohesiveness with the people that are playing and they don't have a deep bench either. So this really, this could impact them down the line. They got through it last year and they got banged up obviously once they got to the playoffs. But I think it's one of those things where Kyrie has his stance and instead of making it, a full on distraction where it's, Oh, he's playing this time. He's practicing here. He's doing this. And Kyrie until you feel otherwise, we're just going to put you to the side and we got to move on with the guys that are here in the locker room that are vaccinated. So like you mentioned, there may be reasons that we're not aware of why he's not doing it or whatever, whatever the case may be, but the nets as an organization have to move on based based on the parameters that are given by the NBA and the United States from that matter. So from a state perspective, so it's just, he's here, he's not here, he's here, he's not here. So until otherwise stated, man, I think it's just, they got to go with who they have because you got to look at their home games. He can't play in some of these States. He can't. So how many games truly will he be playing in, in the season? I'm not, I don't have their schedule in front of me. So, it may be like 20, 30%. I'm just guessing here off the cuff. And then, like you said, once you get to the playoffs, depending on where they may go, that may impact them as well. So I think it's the right move at this time. And it, it gives Kyrie what he's looking for. And the Nets, what they have to do. And I know Kyrie probably wants to hoop and everything, but it's just based on the parameters that they're, they have to play within right now. So. We'll see if anything changes in the foreseeable future, but it is what it is at this time. Baseball playoffs are upon us, and man, I have to say that the Milwaukee Brewers lost to the Atlanta Braves five to four mm -hmm. in game number four uh, down in Atlanta, and the Brewers were in it, man. It was four four in the eighth inning, and uh, obviously uh, Hater gave up a home run to Freeman. Mm -hmm. And another sad way to end a, a very promising season. Uh, we're looking at a Milwaukee Brewers team that actually won 95 games. And so it's just disappointing that the season has come to end like this for the Milwaukee Brewers, a 95 win team. And golly, man, what, what can, what can you say about it? I mean, I, I think what the Brewers are really missing because when you look at their lineup and the the batting averages right mm -hmm. um it it reeks of inconsistency it really does and i just think that the bucks are going to have to during this offseason just really take a hard look at their lineup mm -hmm. the brewers are right there they're right there it's yep. just i think they need to go ahead and have 
I don't know if it's, if it's their hitting coach. I don't know. It has to be something more consistent here. Yelich just was in and out of the lineup for injury purposes throughout the course of the season. Uh, it just, I mean, we're a good defensive team, but it's just, man, I, I tell you, it's, we just don't have any firepower um, when it comes to the bats, I, I believe. So good season by the Brewers, yet a disappointing end to it. I'm anxious to see what happens next year. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I do kind of hate saying wait until next year. But that's what we're where we are right now. So um, we'll see what happens. What say you, Danny? Jason, offense was obviously an issue. They scored six runs in the whole series. Mm-hmm. Six. Two in 27 innings for the first three games. And then four, obviously, yesterday. And you wonder, with Yelich, like you mentioned, as being one part of it, Colton Wong didn't have a good series. And things are magnified in these playoff series because they're shorter. And if a batter bats 187, it's nothing during the regular season, right? Because there's a bigger body of work. But in these playoffs, if you struggle, man, it's magnified and you're going home. So I, their pitching was solid. You, could, you, you couldn't ask for more from the pitching perspective. It was just the offense wasn't there. And I equate this to the Bucks when they got swept by the Heat the year before and when they were in the bubble. Similar to this, where they, they're close to getting swept by a team they really shouldn't have lost to, in my opinion. The Braves are, you know, heating up and everything since August. The Brewers kind of limped into the playoffs. I think they lost 15 to 22 or something like that. So momentum, all kinds of factors may have played into this, but ultimately you just didn't score. So obviously they'll need a bat or two, and they may have to go more small ball. If you look at them sometimes, they're just swinging for the fences. You, know, you may need to bring it in a little bit, get some runners on base. Get those runners, score those runners, or uh, have those knock those runners in. Uh, a few items here, just based on watching this series. Congratulations to the Braves. Uh, I knew it would be a tight series. I just, I just didn't see the Braves taking them out like this. So um, they have some work to do in the off season to propel them for next season. And Danny, now into this little bit of NFL here. Uh, what a very interesting week five that uh, we encountered. Uh, just a whole lot of storylines in this particular week. But let me just highlight a few games here. One game I definitely want to highlight is the Packers Bengals game that went into overtime. Didn't have to go into overtime. There were five missed field goals in the span of uh, a couple of minutes um, going into overtime even. Um, Packers obviously won 25 to 22 uh, in OT, and that was a very intriguing game. I mean, you had Devontae Adams uh, catching uh, the rock here for 206 yards and a touch. Uh, then Aaron Rodgers throwing, throwing it for 344 yards and two touchdowns. Uh, man, it was just a very intriguing game to watch. Aaron Jones, 14 carries for 103 yards. Uh, I think the Packers really, really uh, showed up, uh, but I think they still struggle in the red zone defense. Uh, this seems like they consistently give up uh, touchdowns once their opponents get into the red zone. Uh, I think that's something that needs to be addressed, but we'll see what happens moving forward. Uh, I think by the Packers having an easy well, I can't say easy, but by them having uh, the division that we do have, uh, I think they'll be fine. Uh, big game coming up against the rival Bears. Uh, we'll see what happens. Justin Field um, is obviously doing um, so pretty pretty good there. Um, the Bears went ahead and beat the Raiders, and there's just so much circling around the Raiders organization right now. Uh, and we'll get into that in, in a few minutes here. But 
Oh, another game to highlight is Browns and Chargers. Man, there was absolutely no defense <laughs> being played on that. Um, in an NFL game, the Chargers went ahead and scored 47 points. And oh, by the way, the Browns scored 42. So absolutely no defense in that in that particular game. Uh, and Sunday night's game was very, very interesting where you have the Buffalo Bills uh, really getting some kind of revenge, if you will, uh, against the Kansas City Chiefs where Buffalo went into Kansas City uh, even in a, a lightning delay, uh, 38 to 20, uh, the Bills prevailed. Um, and then another interesting game uh, that we'll talk about here, uh, and I'll let, let you definitely um, a time in, is that your Falcons went to London and got a victory. Yes. I thought for a moment y'all was going to give it up. You weren't the only one. Half. <laughs> I think New York started to wake up at halftime. It was like, oh, okay, we got to start really playing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think their body clocks, the, the time clocks started to really sink in, and they decided to play in the second half. But your Atlanta Falcons went ahead and prevailed 27-20. to 20. And then we'll get into the Monday night game, which was absolutely – uh, intriguing game, uh, more so in the second half by none other than Lamar Jackson. But what say you, Danny? Jason, Falcons took care of business. Kyle Pitts stepped up. He showed out. Ridley didn't make the trip. So I was a little worried about that. And Gage, is, our second receiver, was also out. So it was a time for him to shine, and he, he went off. Man, he had over 100 yards, 119 yards, and a touchdown. And yeah, Atlanta made it interesting again, but they got some key first downs. And this is where a guy like Mike Davis, he is a role, he's been a role player journeyman type running back, but he's a big back and he can get those yards that they need. And that's why I like the signing. It was kind of an under the radar type signing, but when they needed him in the fourth quarter and Cordero Patterson, Patterson too, He's having a heck of a year. So it was great to see them actually finish the game. I was sitting there like, oh, here we go again. Up 17, nothing, and almost blew it, but they prevailed. Uh, We have a bye this week, so that's good. Uh, Arizona remained undefeated this week. They snuck by San Francisco, 17 to 10. That Chargers-Browns game. That was a crazy game. And this weekend, I believe they said there were 13 kicks missed overall. And there was a key one missed in the Chargers-Browns game where the Chargers scored and it was 42-41 and the kicker missed the extra point. But then the Chargers got the ball back and ended up scoring and winning 47-42. But uh, in the last game, you hit on some of the other games, but the last game was that Monday night game where the Baltimore Ravens came back on the Indianapolis Colts and won in overtime 31-25. And for those of you who did not watch the game, Lamar Jackson was struggling. Uh, Struggling, I think, is an understatement. He was missing throws. He fumbled where Indianapolis went down and scored a touchdown. And they they were trailing big. And I don't know what happened to Indianapolis defense, Indianapolis's defense, and Lamar went off and ended up throwing for 442 yards and four touchdowns and ended up winning the game in overtime, 31-25. So it was a statement game, which leads into week six, where the Chargers and the Ravens face off uh, is one of the key matchups for week six. Uh, Another one is the Cardinals and Browns. And the last one is a sneaky one is the Titans and Buffalo Bills. Buffalo's on the road. In Tennessee, and Tennessee seems to play well at home. So that should be an interesting matchup. And I believe that's on Monday night. So, yeah, man, great week of football and always not another good week coming up here where it uh, should be some good action. And to kind of go back to this Las Vegas Raiders, Chicago Bears game and Raiders, I was looking actually forward to that game um, just on account that. Uh, I thought the Raiders were going to prevail, uh, quite honestly. 
Um, been really intrigued by the AFC West, especially uh, with the Raiders and the Chargers. So I really wanted to see, uh, obviously, Justin Herbert really uh, start to really progress and, and move up, if you will, um, and all. But uh, and looking at that Raiders Chicago Bears, just some of the game itself, I was just highly disappointed in the effort uh, of the Raiders. But I believe it's really obviously due to some of the things that's been swirling around at that particular moment in time with regards to John Gruden and the emails. And uh, Dan, this is from the LA Times. Uh, this going to read a little bit here, uh, just to provide some context here. So several inflammatory emails by John Gruden were filed as exhibits in federal court by attorneys for the Washington football team owner, Daniel Snyder in mid June, almost four months before they were leaked to two newspapers and led to John Gruden's resignation as the coach of the Las Vegas Raiders. The heavily redacted emails between Gruden and then Washington football team president Bruce Allen filed in US District Court in Arizona included offensive language and other conversations. Uh, and it kind of goes on and on here uh, at that particular moment in time. Danny, this, these emails were, were really disgusting, quite honestly. Uh, it has really no place. Um, and it really doesn't do the NFL any good, quite honestly. Granted, these, these emails were years ago uh, that has surfaced. Um, man, there's several thousands of emails, apparently, that they have. I believe this is only the beginning. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg, quite honestly, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what has obviously has happened to John Gruden in terms of him resigning. But let's keep in mind where this originated from. This is from a probe, an investigation of the culture of the Washington football team. Obviously, there's been a whole lot happening in Washington, D.C. This is only the beginning, Danny. If they have an email on that. And now they're really, really wanting to push all the emails to be put out, put out there to the public. Man, this is going to be a very interesting next couple of months mm -hmm. um, in terms of discussions in the NFL. All I can say is put your seatbelts on because this is going to be a bumpy ride yep. for the NFL. I really believe that. And not only that, I believe that there's going to be even more implications here of people who are in high places, who have, who has a lot of power in terms of who are they connected with outside of the NFL. I mean, it can even go into politics. It can even go into, I don't know, federal offices. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be widespread. So, like I said, put your seatbelts on. This is going to be a bumpy ride. What say you, Danny? And Jason, I think you hit it all on the head, man. Um, there isn't much to add to this where the Raiders, I don't, you don't know if they're forced to uh, make John Gruden resign or whatever the case may be, but uh, based on what, <laughs> what's, what's been revealed and what may still be out there, I think there's still a lot to, you know, the whole judgment just to see all this stuff. And then, like you said, who else may be involved? So John Gruden may be the first of many that may be implicated based on the information provided. So like you mentioned, the NFL standing by these messages and this is something, you know, like you said, it's from the past. So this is where, you know, a cancel culture now is a, a, it's a, a reality so based on stuff you may have did a long time ago if it comes to comes to light uh it makes puts people in some positions where they have to make decisions to be consistent now with the message that they're um portraying or trying to follow so yeah the nfl's <laughs> they're gonna be in some spots here mm -hmm. where once this um, really comes to light and how they handle all these different situations. So you want it, you're going to have to see if they're going to be consistent, depending on who's involved and what's, what information is uh, presented to the public. Danny, this past Saturday night, the big fight, heavyweight fight, Tyson Fury against Deontay Wilder. 
number three. This is the third time that they have fought. I'm just gonna be real, man. I, I was I was pulling for Deontay Wilder just so that way he can get uh, this a little get back. Yep. Uh, on on Tyson Fury, but in the back of my mind, I, I was like, man, you know Tyson Fury gonna win because he's a little bit more disciplined when it comes to boxing. Deontay Wilder goes in there and just you know swings for the fences uh, at times, if you will. Um, man, this was. I want the commentators, I want the analysts just to stop it. Stop saying that this was the best fight that you have been to in the past 20, 25, 30 years. Stop it. Now, it was an okay fight. I've seen a whole lot better heavyweight championship fights. Mm -hmm. And had I gone to them, I would have said, oh, yeah, this is by far the best championship fight. Easy. Mm -hmm. But I hadn't gone to him, but I know there's been over the past 20, 25 years, some great fights. Yes, congratulations to Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder. I think he's going to have to really consider his next moves and what direction he wants to go here um, in, the, uh, in his career, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of those where I think he really, really needs to sit down and really kind of think about this because he had a new trainer, to my understanding. He had a new trainer, you know, was under a new workout plan, you know, uh, added some pounds to really combat that of Tyson Fury because obviously Tyson Fury is taller, heavier. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Wilder, you know, wanted to at least beef up a little bit the best that he could. So it, to no avail, man, it didn't, it didn't help, man. It didn't help. I mean, yeah. Deontay Wilder did knock down uh, Fury a couple times, but man, uh, Fury just went ahead and just pounded Wilder throughout the night, man. Really, he did. So we'll see. Um, but Danny, this really offered up the question, if we did have a trading card scenario as it pertains to boxing, because we were like, I, I can't recall a boxing card Mm -hmm. A boxing trading card. I, I can't recall that. So we wanted to do a different spin on, on, on this and have a trading card scenario specifically for boxing. What say you, Dan? So, Jason, we have two scenarios tonight. And the first scenario we'll start with is Tyson Fury or Lennox Lewis. So quick bios. Lennox Lewis was a boxer from the United, uh, United Kingdom, 6'5", uh, fought for 14 years. And if those of you who remember, he fought in the 90s, early 2000s. His overall record was 41, 2 and 1 with 32 knockouts. He had an 84 inch reach. Uh, he was a gold medalist in the 88 Olympics in Seoul, Korea, and held multiple championships, WBC, WBA, IBF and Tyson Fury, 6'9 from the UK. He's fought for 13 years so far. He has an 85 inch reach. He's 31 0 and 1 with 22 knockouts. Uh, he didn't receive any, he didn't, uh, ha he doesn't have any Olympic medals, but he did a lot on the junior circuit. And then WBA championships, WBC, WBO, IBF. So, Jason, in this scenario, whose card would you want between Lennox Lewis and Tyson Fury? And Danny, one of the reasons why we wanted to go with these two is because we want we thought about boxers who had some height. Mm -hmm. So um, these two boxers had some height. Danny, this was an interesting, interesting scenario here but let me take a moment here and just read off some of the names that Lennox Lewis faced mm -hmm. Donovan Ruddick Tony Tucker uh, Tommy Morrison Ray Mercer Andrew Galata Evander Holyfield not once 
but twice. Uh, Francois Botha, Hasim Rahman, not once, but twice. Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson, Vitaly Klitschko. The reason why I named those boxers off is because obviously Lennox Lewis not only faced them, but he won against them for the most part. I think there was one in where he lost against uh, Hasim Rahman and there was some payback uh, gained in the next time that they fought. But my point in saying those names, Danny, is, hey, man, this Hall of Fame boxer faced some Hall of Fame competition. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you can't deny that. Now, what I wanted to do, I, I wanted to, I actually went ahead and looked at that fight. And it was his last fight, come to think about it. Um, and I'm, I'm reading these names off of LennoxLewis.com, okay? His last fight was against Vitaly Klitschko. I was like, let me go ahead and look at that fight. So I started to look at that fight, man. And Lennox Lewis actually won that fight off a of TKO in round six. Now, that was primarily because of a deep cut that Klitschko experienced uh, in, I want to say, round three. Uh, it was a deep cut right on his eye. Mm -hmm. It's almost to the point where it's like one of those one where Rocky was like, man, cut me, Mick, cut me. That's what was what Klitschko could have said to his corner, cut me, because his stuff was hanging off like that. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I believe they ended up stopping the fight. And so I, I, I bring out Klitschko because those are the, that's the fighter that Lennox Lewis faced, and that's the fighter that Tyson Fury faced. In looking at Tyson Fury's, you know, uh, list of competitors, man, I don't, I don't even know who, who a lot of these people are, man. Um, I'm just gonna be real. It's no disrespect to them. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna be real. I, I don't know who a lot of these these cats are, man. Um, and so with that, Danny, I gotta go with Lennox Lewis, man. Give me Lennox Lewis all day. It's not it, not to take away from Tyson Fury at all, uh, because he is a unorthodox boxer. He faints a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, he's a lot quicker as a big man than what people I think people really give him. He takes his shots. He gets knocked out, and you know he gets back up too. So uh, I give him kudos for that. But man, give me Lennox Lewis card all day. What say you, Jason? We're going to agree on this one. If, if you look at the boxers, uh, Lennox Lewis, technical fighter, man, he would hit you with that jab, that uppercut. He, he could wear you down. He could knock you out if he needed to. Uh, he hit based on, and it's hard to compare, right? Because you're looking at two different videos. You're not watching them face each other. But to me, Lennox Lewis was a harder hitter as well mm -hmm. than Tyson Fury. Obviously, it's hard. It's all speculation, <laughs> and I'm just trying to go by what I'm seeing on, you know, the fights on YouTube and everything. But all in all, with all the accolades between the both of them, I think from a trading card scenario, I would want Lennox Lewis as well. He faced a lot of greats. Uh, he was he was a great boxer, man. His amateur list of accomplishments was amazing yeah uh so he just was in my opinion a car that i would want if there was a card available for him and there may be some market where there are boxing cars <laughs> but if that was the case i would take his all day over tyson fury i think fury he's knocking out he's taking out everyone he's facing but and he's a big dude and he's a he's a good boxer but I think just Lennox Lewis is consistent and his style was one that can't be really duplicated for a man his size and how he 
he was the way he was technical and still can knock you out. Second scenario, Jason. Mm -hmm. This is more of the featherweight, welterweight division. And the training car scenario would be Floyd Mayweather Jr. or Sugar Ray Leonard. So quick bios, start with Floyd. Money Mayweather, as they call him. 50 and 0 with 27 knockouts. He's 5'8. Fought for 21 years. Uh, he seems to retire. He may pop out of retirement here or there, <laughs> depending on how he's feeling. 72-inch uh, reach. In his amateur boxing career, had a ton of accomplishments. Uh, one I'll highlight here is the bronze featherweight medalist at the 96 Olympics in Atlanta. Had He had the WBC super featherweight, WBC lightweight, WBC super lightweight list of championships. Sugar Ray Leonard was 36, three and one with 25 knockouts, five, nine, fought for 20 years, 70 inch reach, amateur boxing career, another decorated career here. Uh, he got the gold light welterweight medalist medal at the 76 Olympics in Montreal and held a number of championships himself. So Jason, you got Sugar Ray Leonard, you got Floyd May Mayweather. Whose car would you want? Dang, this was a tough one, man. This was a tough one. Um, I, I had to go back and just like I did for Lennox Lewis, I had to look at the list of boxers Sugar Ray actually fought. Okay. Uh, in 78, he fought Floyd Mayweather's dad, or mm -hmm. excuse me, uncle, uh, with a KO uh, in the 10th round. But moving forward, I mean, I mean, he his amateur boxing career was was impressive, man. You, and one thing you got to highlight, too, about amateur boxers, man, when they box a lot, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm looking at in 77, when Sugar Ray fought, he fought in February, May, June, September, November, December. That's in this one year, man. Um, so kudos to the amateur boxers, you know, going through and and wanting to make a name for themselves. But going back to Sugar Ray, listen, man, Robert Duran, he fought Robert Duran twice. He lost to him, and then he got some uh, get back in that same year. Um, Tommy Hitman Hearns. He fought Tommy Hitman Hearns in 81, man. That's when they had 15 rounds to fight. Mm -hmm. At the mountain, round number 14. Um, Marvin Marvelous Hagler, rest in peace, fought him. Uh, he fought Tommy Hitman Hearns again in 89, Robert Duran again. Uh, Terry Norris, uh, Hector Camacho. Come on, man. He fought all these greats. Uh, and you look at, obviously, Floyd Money Mayweather, and you look at his list, and in my opinion, man, there's no comparison. There's no comparison. Yeah, Money Mayweather is 50 and 0. Uh, gotta give him props on that. But if I look at Money Mayweather's list of opponents, man. Um, I'm not seeing really opponents that really stick out, man. Um, I'm just going to be frank with you. Uh, Carlos Rios, um, come on, man. Um, don't get me wrong. These are some great boxers. They obviously went through the amateur ranks to get to that point and, and, and uh, to have a, a championship fight. Uh, but I think, obviously, Floyd Money Mayweather's breakout the fight was against none other than the golden boy. Uh, and that, uh, again, that was in 2007, uh, where he faced Oscar De La Hoya. That was his money, his money fight. That was the one that really, um, brought him to prominence. And then he faced, you know, he, he did face uh, Zab Judah the year before, uh, Ricky Hatton, uh, he faced uh, Shane Mosley 
He's faced Victor Ortiz. Um, Canelo Alvarez, uh, now that's a name that does stick out. Um, so he did have uh, some interesting fights. And then who can forget the Manny Pacquiao fight? Um, and then Conor McGregor, which uh, I, I wouldn't really even count, quite honestly. I say all that to say this, man. The best nick, one of the best nicknames in sports, Sugar. Sugar Ray, come on, man. You can't deny that, man. That's a great nickname. Uh, and with that long list of Hall of Fame opponents that Sugar Ray has faced mm-hmm. and won, I'm going with Sugar Ray Leonard card. Give me his card. Let's say you. Jason, from a fighting perspective, I was trying to compare their styles. And obviously, Sugar Ray is a little bit bigger. Not much, but you look at the competition, you lay that out, great. Sugar Ray, every time he was fighting, he was fighting someone pretty good. And he had a really good record considering who he fought. And I thought Sugar Ray was a better offensive fighter than Floyd. Floyd, I think, was better defensively because he, he can move so fast, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and two, you got – say, Yeah. The shoulder roll, yep. And Floyd had those hand injuries too. So that kind of changed his career where he had to get more defensive because of those hands where he couldn't come with the punch he had before the injuries. So saying all that, Floyd being undefeated and, you know, being who he is, you know, flamboyant, talking that talk and not being beat. Versus Sugar Ray, decorated, Hall of Famer, did everything, man. I remember some of those fights being younger, man, trying to watch those on HBO, going to somebody's house who had HBO, <laughs> trying to watch those fights or whatever channel they were on. And this one's tough for me from a card perspective. From a fighting perspective, I think it's Sugar Ray. From a card, I'm going to take Floyd Mayweather's card. And the only reason I'm saying that is with him being undefeated, I think it might have a little more value than Sugar Ray's card. They're both Hall of Famers. They're both that. That's the only reason I would look at his card. And he, Sugar Ray was not the in your face type person, right? If you say, see him, he's very soft spoken. And every time I think about him, I think of living color. Uh, with three men and a baby, that's skit. But, but anyway, but he he wasn't like Money May, where Money May could drive his car's value based on saying something. Now, he could take the value down, too, by saying something, too. So don't get it. I don't want to get it twisted. But in this scenario, from a trading car perspective, I would take Floyd's car just due to him having that undefeated record and his persona to drive the value of the car even further as he retires and tries to stay in the limelight all right fans what say you thank you for joining us at back porch talk podcast you can also join us on twitter by tweeting us at back underscore podcast for more information, you can go to our website, which is backporchtalkpodcast.com. You can also email us at backporchtalkpodcast at gmail.com. Again, thank you for joining us. And remember that there's enough hate in the world. So go ahead and spread a little love.